So it seems we should not be overly, well, we, we, we are sorry to lose language uh, in, when the populations that speak the language are very small and cannot sustain it, say in the Pacific, the Pacific Islands and in some isolated places. And some people lament very much that there is this rise of English or whatever people think is English, uh, which if I open a parenthesis, of course, the future of English nowadays depends more on India than on the British Isles, as you might imagine, by the sheer number of people speaking. And when, I don't know whether you follow that, I'm, I'm digressing a little bit, but it's kind of a, these are the curiosities that make life so interesting. Uh, for example, when you, when you saw, there was a whole debate between people uh, sending SMS messages between the US, uh, Australia, and some other English-speaking uh, communities, including India, I mean those who do speak English. And because, uh, let's say, the, the software would be attuned to the US style, but uh, that did not match at all what people would use, say, in Australia or elsewhere. So there was a huge debate. They all said they were native English speakers. But of course, when it came down to making the abbreviations and the shortcuts and so on, you know, it was Babylonia. They could not. <laughs> <laughs> so that much for, let's say, the, the perhaps sometimes slightly exaggerated concerns about losing too much of the linguistic diversity. We do lose some and we do have a match of Chinese, uh, Spanish and of course English as the very dominant uh, sort of languages in the world. But um, I don't think diversity will disappear anytime soon because human history tells us that yes there is great merit in being able to communicate with us, so there's wonderful incentive to learn other idioms. But at the same time, we do need our corners for retreat. And uh, given the way our brain functions, I'm quite confident that uh, even though we lose some languages, we may also gain some new ones in the future. Um, I would like to share with you another quick thought uh, about uh, cultural diversity and that uh, was brought to my attention by a colleague in the States, um, Richard Nisbet. If you have an opportunity to read his book, it's really, it's easily written and it's very worthwhile. And um, he challenges, in fact, he, he is concerned about cultural diversity and he challenged the notion that uh, humans and human cultures are all at some level the same. His, his suggestion in fact is, is that human culture has many unique fa factors and, and features and there is no universal human culture after so many hundred thousand years of human development. We have diversified in, in wonderful ways. And he illustrates that uh, through a lot of empirical research. If I bang it into a nutshell, really, it's a little bit forceful to, to do it in two minutes, but um, what he demonstrates through his empirical research is that uh, in mid, I mean, it's not black and white, but let's say that the cultures deriving or stringing up from the origin of the Greek, Greek argumentative logic uh, have a particular way of approaching the world, trying to categorize, put it into classifications, and basically construct logical arguments to demonstrate that one perspective is superior to the other, and that you are right and the other is wrong. So we are very argumentative. That comes with a lot of other implications of how we look at the world and how we see the world, how we experience the world. 
And what Nisbet suggests, after working for many, many years in, in different Asian countries, is that, and of course, I don't want to sort of steamroller Asia, it's, it's most of humanity, it's hugely diverse between the countries, but there are some common traits, so I'm caricaturing a little bit, just to make the point that the perceptions are not the same across the world. Now, in many Asian societies, what he has found is that um, there is no such thing as this drive we have to be right and to put a label and categorize everything. What he finds in many Asian kind of cultures is that um, there is a different relationship between the individual and the context in which the individual lives. Uh, people define themselves through context and not through saying, I don't know, I'm a human being and that in that family, uh, etc and putting a label, father, mother, kid, auntie, uh, grandparents, and so on. Um, when, when they show uh, the same pictures to mummies and kids in some Asian countries and in some Western countries, the way they would relate to it were quite dramatically different. Say, when you categorize in Asia you may find a cow and grass and some other things and other animals the, 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 the kids may put together the cow and the grass but not the cow and other mammals while in Europe you may find that the kids tend to put the animals under one roof of I don't know mammals for example but not put the cow together in the same category as grass, right? But for an Asian kid, or say a Chinese or, a, or Japanese kid, the, the cow eats the grass, there is a relationship, it needs that grass to live, and it, it, it just sort of illustrates that you look at the scene with different eyes. There was one uh, particularly striking example I remember from that book, which is titled The Geography of Thought, that de describes how students from uh, the US and from China make description of the same aquarium. And of course, how could it be? I, of course, I remember the aquarium scene being a fish person. And there was a big fish and some smaller fish and algae and various things. Now, the US uh, students would describe the aquarium scene, you know, the big fish darting backwards and forwards and chasing. And the other, the Asian kids or the Asian students would describe a varied aquarium scene where different species interact with one another and there is the vegetation in there and they nip at what they find on the bottom of the aquarium and this and that. And when you only read the description without seeing the aquarium, you do not think that they are talking about the same aquarium. And I'm just saying that, not, not you know, to make us alert, not to say one is better than the other. Um, but simply to make us aware that different cultures react differently to the same situation they may encounter. Now, for some situations, argumentative logic is clearly superior, but for some other situations, I think West, people embedded in a Western culture could learn a lot from Asian cultures in the sense that, for example, if if you don't have to be right all the time, which is the case or the tendency more in Asia, where you accommodate things because you define yourself in relation to your wider environment, not having to affirm that you are horse all the time. Um, it means you have a different way also of handling conflict. You can accommodate more easily things that may create very different and opposing views in Europe. 
where you spend a lot of energy trying to say, oh, you know, but this shows that I'm right and you are not. No. Of course, there are sometimes very good reasons why you want to be argumentative and, and argue your way so that you know a better solution be found. But um, you know, in, for the harmony in a group. And uh, if your objective is to encourage cooperation, some, you know, you, we may gain from borrowing some of these um, Asian-based uh, cultural traits. Now, uh, will these differences disappear? <coughs> um, yes and no. Um, it's been shown that uh, people who are for some time exposed to the other culture are perfectly able to learn. Uh, the, the US kids living for a long time in Japan will be, be less aggressive, less affirmative and much more accommodating and vice versa. The Asians living in the States will pick up some of the argumentative skills and become more, you know, Forceful in the way they impose their presence on you know, in a group, for example. But um, Nisbet himself thinks these differences will not disappear fast because, in fact, he thinks they will stay around for a long period because of the way uh, even early child education is done and. These empirical observations, what mummies tell their kids from baby age onwards. So it's very deeply ingrained in the different cultures. Um, and uh, so, viva la difference.